I'm excited to hear from Dr. Chandran. Um, she is a uh, transplant nephrologist here at UCSF and the inpatient director of the kidney transplant unit. Um, she completed a medical school in Delhi, India before um, doing her residency in Arizona in her, and then subsequently doing nephrology and transplant nephrology fellowships here in the Bay Area at Stanford and then at UCSF. Um, she's been here at UCSF since 2010 and takes care of living donors and transplant patients before and after transplant. I fortunately work with her on a daily basis and she is a huge asset to our program. Dr. Chandran is also a uh, clinical trials um, physician at the ITN, and this is a uh, NIH funded network that focuses on clinical trials to achieve tolerance in transplant patients. Today, she will be continuing uh, on the theme of expanding the donor pool. As we discussed, we have shortages of organs which are leading to deaths on the transplant waiting list. Living donation, which you heard about last week, is a way to increase the donor pool. But within this approach, there have been many innovations to further expand, um, which um, Dr. Chandran will be telling us about today. Thank you again, Dr. Chandran, for taking the time to tell us about a few of these strategies. So the title of my talk is, Can I Borrow Your Kidney? And what I'm going to talk about is the National Kidney Exchange, Altruistic Donors, and Voucher Systems. So this is the outline of the talk. So first, I'm going to give a brief intro of live kidney donor transplant as a treatment option for end-stage renal disease, which is another way of saying really kidney failure. And I know that some of the folks may have uh, listened to the prior presentation where we talked a little bit about live donor transplants, but I think I'll you know start again with a little introduction to that. Then I'll talk about kidney paired exchange programs. What are they and how do these programs facilitate live donor transplant of incompatible donor recipient pairs? and a little bit of discussion of what makes donor recipient pairs incompatible or compatible. Next, I'll talk about innovations in kidney paired exchange programs, including the inclusion of compatible pairs, non-directed donor chains, and what is known as advanced donation programs. And finally, I'll give a little bit of a snapshot of the impacts of the National Kidney Registry on live donor transplants in the United States. So these, this, the next two slides are mandatory slides that a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, has to show to uh, sort of, you know, tell us or uh, to remind us all about the epidemic of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease in uh, the population. So here, are these uh, data, these pictures are from uh, the CDC, and we know that there is a rising prevalence of chronic kidney disease in the United States. More than one in seven or 15% of US adults are estimated to have chronic kidney disease, and that's about 37 million people. And approximately one in three people with diabetes and one in five adults actually with high blood pressure may have chronic kidney disease. And chronic kidney disease is a problem that affects disproportionately people who are older. So people who are greater than 65 years old are more likely to have chronic kidney disease. And you can see that 38% of such patients, such folks in the United States have some element of impairment of their kidney function. Patients who are non-Hispanic Blacks and Hispanics are also more likely to have kidney disease than non-Hispanic Asians and whites. So as a result of these 37 million people with living with chronic kidney disease, even if only a very small fraction of them end up developing kidney failure, we still have a growing population of end people with end-stage renal disease. So between 2000 and 2019, the number of new end-stage renal disease cases increased by 42%. The total number of people who actually had already had ESRD, so people living in the population with ESRD doubled, and diabetes and hypertension remain the leading causes of end-stage renal disease in 2019. So as diabetes and high blood pressure have gone up in the population, so too have the consequences of these problems, which is kidney failure and chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. So not only is this disease problematic for the health of our patients, for the mortality of our patients, but it is also expensive. End-stage renal disease accounted for $51 billion of Medicare spending in 2019. So end-stage renal disease is a Medicare entitlement. So in 1972, an act of Congress 
was passed, which allowed patients who have end-stage renal failure to be entitled to coverage under Medicare. So this is a unique situation. This is a really a unique case where having a disease actually entitles you to Medicare, whereas, you know, otherwise to access Medicare, most people in this country have to be over the age of 65 years for them to qualify for Medicare. But end-stage renal disease is a Medicare entitlement. And since 1972, the costs of end-stage renal disease and the proportion of the Medicare budget that is devoted to treating people with end-stage renal disease has continued to rise. So even though people with end-stage renal disease account for one and a half percent of Medicare beneficiaries, they ultimately end up consuming 7.2% of the Medicare budget. And actually this $51 billion that was spent accounts for 1.8% of federal spending in 2019. So this is a problem that concerns all of us. This is not just a problem of some stranger in the community who has kidney failure or chronic kidney disease. This is, these are our brothers and sisters who have kidney failure because these are people that you know, these are people in your family, these are, you know, people that you work with who have chronic kidney disease, who have kidney failure, but these are also people that even if we don't know somebody with chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease, this is where our taxpayer dollars are going. They are going to cover this disease and the costs associated with this disease. So this is a huge public health problem. So what do people do when they have end-stage renal disease? So there are typically two treatment, you know, there are basically two treatment options for people with kidney failure. They can either do dialysis, and dialysis is when you don't actually fix the cause of the end-stage renal disease. So you cannot cure kidney disease in this case, but what you can do is manage the complications of kidney disease. So people get dialysis treatments, which is really a way where we can clean the blood and remove the toxins that accumulate as a result of kidney failure. However, dialysis really doesn't replace all the other functions of the kidney. The kidney is not just a washing machine, so to speak. The kidney actually produces hormones. The kidney is involved in vitamin metabolism. It is involved in a lot of other functions that some of which we understand very well and some of those which we don't. So actually, even though people get dialysis and they are able to therefore survive, survival on dialysis is not that great. And also people have what we call the uremic syndrome, where these toxins, even though we remove them periodically from the blood, we are never able to gain complete toxin-free environment or a low enough level of toxins where patients actually feel good and functional and have good quality of life. So chronic kidney diseases and end-stage renal failure is a burden, not just in terms of mortality, but also in terms of morbidity, in terms of quality of life of these patients. So then we come on to the next treatment option for kidney failure, which is kidney transplant. So kidney transplant, again, is not a cure because, you know, even with kidney transplant, you have to take medications, you have to see the doctor regularly, and it is not a permanent solution necessarily for kidney failure. But in many ways, kidney transplant can be better than being on dialysis because by getting a kidney, first of all, you can get way more function and therefore way better removal of toxins as compared to being on dialysis. And also this new kidney can do all the things that a kidney is supposed to do. So even if you have just one kidney, it can still do make hormones, it can still metabolize vitamins, it can still transport things that it's supposed to transport without uh, you know, us having to sort of mimic and guess all these things. So the fact is that kidney transplantation for people who are healthy enough to receive it is a far better option for survival as well as quality of life when compared to being on dialysis. So this was a study that was published in 1999. So, you know, I don't know how many people here were actually born uh, before, uh, after 1999 maybe, but so a long time ago, but an old study, but still a goodie. So this is where uh, basically these researchers, they looked at patients who had been, uh, who had been diagnosed with kidney failure between 1991 and 1996. So about 250,000 patients during that time interval, during that five-year time interval, ended up on dialysis, out of which about 46,000 uh, people were placed on the waiting list, okay? And out of these 46,000 people, there were about 23,000 people who underwent a transplant from a deceased donor. 
So what the researchers did is that they looked at people who were on dialysis during the period of time. They looked at people who were on the waiting list and they looked at people who were on the waiting list and ended up getting a kidney transplant. And what they found was that basically, when you look at the waiting list and you compare people on the waiting list to people who have kidney failure, that the risk of death is 49% lower among those on the waiting list compared to everybody on dialysis. So that means that already on the waiting list, we are putting the healthier folks, the people who are more likely to survive the transplant surgery, be able to take medications and do well after transplant. When they looked at the risk of death after transplantation, and that's what this graph shows here. So on the x-axis, you can see the days since the transplant. And on the y-axis, you can see the relative risk of death and what it shows you is that for the first two weeks after a kidney transplant, the risk of death is higher than being on dialysis. It's about 2.8 times higher. Then the risk goes down and by day 106, so about three months after transplant, the risk goes back to the risk of death that you had when you were on the waiting list. So this is comparing people who got a transplant to those on the waiting list. So at day 106, the risk becomes equal and then it takes another 120 days or so for your survival to become equal because you have to compensate for this area which is under you know this curve over here so it takes another like i said 120 130 days so that by day 244 you have now lived long enough that you have compensated for this excess risk seen right after transplant and then after that, everything you enjoy is actually the increased survival that is seen after transplantation. So transplantation improves survival in patients as compared to being on the wait list. And if you look at it in terms of number of years, you can see that for people, particularly younger people, between 20 to 39 years of age, getting a transplantation actually added, if you projected long-term survival out, it would actually add 17 years to their life, okay, compared to being on the waiting list. So clearly transplantation has a huge survival benefit. And this analysis was done looking at all categories of patients. And they found that for all age groups, all racial groups, for men as well as for women, and for patients who had diabetes, patients who had glomerulonephritis, or other causes of end-stage renal disease, every single group of patients benefited from getting a transplant compared to staying on the waiting list. So our goal should be therefore to get a kidney transplant in patients who are otherwise candidates for kidney transplants who are healthy enough to undergo a transplant. So not only is transplantation beneficial, we should also, in, when it comes to people getting kidney transplants, they can get it from either a live donor. This is a you know friend, a family member, a neighbor, a co-worker, boyfriend, girlfriend, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, anybody who wants to donate a kidney to you, or you could have, or you wait for a kidney from a deceased donor. So deceased donors are people who die in accidents, of a stroke, of other conditions, where their organs are still healthy enough that they can be used for another person. So when you look at the deceased donor transplants versus living donor transplants, you can see that the survival benefit for the patient as well as for the life of the kidney is amplified if you get a live donor transplant as compared to a deceased donor transplant. So there are several benefits of live donor kidney transplant. First, you can avoid these extended waiting times because to get a kidney from a deceased donor can take many, many years, particularly in this part of the country where we have lots and lots of people on the waiting list, but we don't have that many organs. It also gets you better organ quality because, you know, kidneys come from deceased donors. They are not as necessarily as healthy as kidneys that come from live donors because the deceased donor may have some diseases like diabetes or high blood pressure or other conditions that may have caused some wear and tear on their kidney. But when we take kidneys from live donors, we are very selective about the patients we take these kidneys from. We want to make sure that they are in good health and they don't have any kidney problems at all and that they do not have risk factors that are going to make them develop kidney failure in the future. So generally, the, or the organ is of a higher quality because it comes from a healthy donor. Also, because living donor transplants can be planned and you don't sort of rely on you know, chance 
then you can plan the surgery in a way that the recipient is ready, the recipient is in good health, and that you have a very short ischemic time. Ischemic time is the time that the kidney is not receiving blood when it has been taken out of the donor's body, but is not yet attached to a blood supply in the recipient's body. So when you have a planned kidney transplant, that ischemic time is often very short, and almost always it is less than two hours, particularly if the donor and the recipient are being transplanted, uh, I mean, are getting the surgeries done at the same, you know, institution. And this kidney, because it is coming from a healthy donor, because of the short ischemic time, and because it is has better organ quality, it usually functions immediately. So unlike kidneys that come from a deceased donor, where the kidney may not work right away, and it may take, you know, about 25 to 30 percent of these kidneys, maybe what we call sleepy kidneys, where people still need to get dialysis for a few days or a few weeks before the kidney works, the live donor kidney transplant almost always works right away. And in this graph, as you can see, that there is improved graft survival. So this is what we call death censored graft survival. So this is looking at kidneys. That's, you know, how long did these kidneys survive compared to people, how many people are surviving with functioning kidneys? And you look and see that living donors are more likely, so over, you know, so sort of about 93, 94% of live donors at five years have a functioning kidney versus about, you know, 87, 88% for deceased donors. So we should all be trying to get live donor kidneys into our transplant patients. However, there is a crisis of kidney shortage in the United States. And so this may have been something that you have seen before. But in the US, uh, I got these data from HRSA, the Health Research Services Administration, just a week ago. But in 2022, there are 90,000 patients waiting for a kidney. And you can see that on this graph here. This is the organ that is that people are waiting for the most often. And there were 5,819 transplants so far, which is a huge number of transplants, but only a drop in the ocean when you look at the number of people who are waiting. Particularly when we look at California, there are 17,700 patients waiting for a kidney. We've done 660 transplants so far this year, and about 20% of them are from a live donor. So why is that? Why can't everybody get a live donor kidney? So people have to meet basic eligibility criteria to be a live donor. So, you know, uh, it's not enough to just step forward and say, hey, I'm here to give my kidney. We want to make sure that the donor is healthy that they have good kidney function and that they have no major risk factors for kidney disease. And as you remember, risk factors for kidney disease include things like diabetes, high blood pressure, and the prevalence of these conditions in the population has been rising over the last few years, the last few decades. And then one thing to remember is that you may be healthy, you may have good kidney function and no major risk factors for kidney disease, but you may still not be the ideal donor for that recipient. Because if you're much older, say say you are you know, 60 or 70 years old, you could be very healthy and have good kidney function for your age. But if you're donating, for instance, to your 25 year old son or to you know, your grandchild, then that kidney is not going to be the best quality for that recipient, right? So that recipient is a young recipient who may be living for another 20, 30 years. And your kidney has already spent 60, 70 years in your body and has wear and tear on it that is going to shorten the life of this kidney. So if the, another thing that can affect the long-term survival of the kidney is size mismatch. So, you know, I may be a five foot to a slim, uh, you know, older woman. And if I'm donating to a, uh, you know, my husband or somebody who is much taller than me, more muscular than I am, then it may be that my kidney just doesn't have enough mass to provide good long-term function for a long time for a big recipient. So significant age and size mismatch can result in graft function, which is not, you know, as desirable as we would like, but results in suboptimal graft function. The second thing, of course, is that the, you know, the kidney donor has to be willing to donate. So sometimes people, even though they really want to help their uh, recipient, they may be in a situation where because of either their work or their other responsibilities or due to anxiety or other conditions, this may not be the right time for them to donate. So we have to make sure that psychologically and in terms of the support that the donor is going to receive, that they're going to be in a good place to donate. And finally, we come to the question of compatibility. So you, the donor and the recipient, they have to be compatible. What do we mean by compatible? What we mean by compatible is 
that the recipient should not have what we call antibodies against the donor kidney. Antibodies can be antibodies against blood groups. These are things that we are already born with. So if you have a blood group A, then if you put that kidney into somebody else who has a blood group O, O means that they don't have A antigen and therefore they have antibodies against A, then you are going to end up rejecting that kidney. So that is called blood group incompatibility. So if you have antibodies against the donor's blood type, then that can cause rejection in the kidney and then that can shorten the life of the kidney. The other type of compatibility that we look for is HLA compatibility. This is also called tissue compatibility. All of us look different. This, you know, this is because our immune system has evolved over the ages to recognize things that are foreign. So even these small differences that we have, you know, among our cells and the antigens on our cells, these are genetically determined. These can trigger a response in the recipient. And if the recipient has seen some of these antigens before, then they can form HLA antibodies and then they can, you know, they may refuse to accept the kidney. So it's kind of like vaccination. It's kind of like if you get the measles vaccine, then later when you see measles, your immune system ramps up and then you are going to destroy that measles virus and really not let it take up residence inside your body, right? So similarly, if people have been exposed to tissue before, like blood, trans blood transfusions or had a pregnancy or even had a previous organ transplant, then it may become very difficult to do another organ transplant because these people may have antibodies and their immune system has already been primed by the exposure to foreign antigens, and then they may be more likely to reject the kidney. So because of these, these incompatibility issues, people who want to donate are healthy enough to donate, may still not be able to donate to their intended recipient because there is a higher risk of acute rejection and of shortened graft survival when we do ABO and HLA incompatible transplants. Now, there are some treatments available to do what we call desensitization, which is where we can remove these antibodies from the recipient or try to make the recipient stop producing these antibodies. Now, these treatments are difficult. They don't always work and they're associated with their own problems. They can make the person's immune system very weak. They can make, you know, increase their risk of getting infections and other sorts of complications. So, it's difficult, it's expensive, and doesn't always work. So what is the option for these patients? Can incompatible pairs get a live donor transplant without desensitization? So switching gears a tiny bit, I'm going to talk about Professor Alvin Roth. So this Professor Alvin Roth won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2012. And basically he won is a Nobel Prize in, uh, this Nobel Prize was actually jointly awarded to him and to Lloyd Shapley for the theory and practice of market design. What Professor Roth and Professor Shapley had worked on is something called matching markets. So matching markets are markets in which you can't just choose what you want. Like even if you can afford it, like let's say I want to go to Harvard and uh, you know actually do medical school, go into the Harvard Medical School. It's not like I can you know pay them a whole, bunch of money. So the question is, you need to have two, two groups. The, you also have to be chosen, right? So you have, you have a compatibility issue now. So you, this is not a market which is price dependent, so to speak. This is a market in which you have to match. And a stable matching is one where there are no two people who are not matched to each other, but who would actually prefer to be matched to each other than who they are matched to. So in a matching market, you need to have both people in that market be willing to be matched with each other. And there is nobody else higher on their hierarchy that is willing to match with them. So this was essentially the market design work that, Dr., uh, that Professor Roth did. And what he also said, you know, what this led to is what we call the kidney paired exchange program. And this is a paper that he published in 2005 called a kidney exchange clearing house in New England. So this was first applied in the New England hospitals under the New England program for kidney exchange, where he developed an algorithm which allowed you to match incompatible pairs. So this is from, again, from his Nobel Prize lecture, but you can see this figure here. It's called a two-pair kidney exchange where donor one has blood type A, 
and is therefore incompatible with recipient one who has blood type B. Now donor two has blood type B and is incompatible with their recipient who has blood type A. So a simple algorithm can be created to identify these incompatible pairs and allow kidneys to be transplanted between these compatible recipients and donors from different pairs. So this is called pair donor exchange. It is also called swap donation. But paired swap donation in these cases involves anesthetizing both donors simultaneously. So these kidneys are often done at the same time. They are usually done in the neighboring, you know, in the same hospital, at the same OR. But it involves anesthetizing both the donors simultaneously to prevent either one from backing out after the recipient had received a kidney from the other donor. Now, this is kind of a peculiar problem for the United States because under the National Organ Transplant Act of 1984, you're not allowed to buy and sell kidneys, but that also implies that you can't make contracts for kidneys. You can't say, well, if I get you a kidney today, then you will give your kidney tomorrow. So because of that, and you know, because these pro, there's a high cost to losing your donor, right? Like, let's say you have this donor who wants to donate their kidney to you, you're incompatible with each other, and therefore they can't donate their kidney to you, and now they donate to somebody else, you want to be sure that you get your kidney from the other recipient's donor, right? You don't want to be left in the lurch without your bargaining chip. You don't want your donor to have donated and for you to still be on the waiting list because the other donor says, nope, I changed my mind. So because there is no binding contract and there is no way to enforce a binding contract. And it's also kind of repugnant, right? We don't want to enforce contracts on people and tell them, hey, you promised your organ, now you'd better give it. Because the whole concept of living donation is based on the fact that it's voluntary and people need to be able to feel like they can back out if they want to. So that's why these organs happen simultaneously. And in this picture, actually, you see Professor Roth standing in this yellow outfit here. And this is Dr. Steve Woodall, who is a very famous transplant surgeon at Cincinnati, who is doing a, uh, you know, looking at this kidney and uh, that they have procured. And actually, this involves a lot of communication, coordination. People have to say, hey, we have the kidney here. Do you have the kidney there? And so on. At least in the beginning, that's how it used to be. And it involves a lot of manpower and effort. You can imagine now you have a donor surgeon, you have a recipient surgeon for this case, then you have another donor surgeon and a recipient surgeon for the other case. And then you need all this operating rooms, you need all this staff. So even though we have, there is a market now, a way of exchanging kidneys or allocating kidneys to different pairs, be, you know, between pairs, it is what is called a thick market in economic design. It is a congested market. It, you know, it is constrained by the fact that all of these have to happen at the same time or more or less the same time. So kidney pair donation programs in the US, just looking at that, you know, uh, so this of course started in about 2004 or 2005 is around the time that these kidney programs started coming into being as the, uh, Professor Roth worked with the New England programs. And then, you know, then we had a sort of, uh, you know, very bright person and energetic person, Gareth Hill, who basically started the biggest, the first and the largest kidney pair donation program in the US. So this is called the National Kidney Registry. And this started because you have here in this picture, Jan and Garrett, and their youngest daughter was 10 years old and her kidney suddenly failed. And basically they realized that she needed a donor. However, uh, Jan and the oldest daughter were incompatible because of blood type with this child. And then Mr. Garrett Hill was initially thought to be compatible, but then later it was found to be HLA incompatible because the little girl had developed antibodies against uh, you know, his particular HLA antigens. So they had sort of a mad scramble and ultimately they, you know, this you, you can read the story on kidneyregistry.org. They were able to find a compatible live donor among a family member. However, it got Mr. Hill thinking. And, you know, he really started this National Kidney Registry as a result of this difficulty that he personally experienced when trying to find a kidney for his young daughter. The other kidney pair donation programs in the U.S. currently include the Alliance for Paired Kidney Donation, the UNOS Kidney Pair Donation Pilot Program, and of course, there are also these local kidney paired exchange programs where two or three centers in a particular area may collaborate together to exchange, uh, you know, to have exchanges being done between incompatible pairs. So one question that comes up, you know, is 
when you try to expand the scale of this, right? So instead, the more pairs you have, it makes sense automatically, right? If you have only two pairs of incompatible, you know, people, then you may not be able to find a match. But if you have lots and lots of pairs in this system, then you could find a match. But how do you get lots and lots of pairs into the system? If you have a national kidney registry, then that means that you have patients, donors, and recipients who are scattered nationally, right? So when these kidney paired exchange programs started and they were done locally, then the thought was that the donor would travel to the transplant center and donate their kidney so that the kidney transplant can happen, the recipient is already there, and the donor travels. But when you have kidneys which are now going to people in different places and the pairs may be in completely different states, it doesn't seem fair to make the donor travel. Plus, like who's going to pay for the cost of this travel? And also the donor often need, wants to be with their recipient. Often it's a family member. Often there are issues of care involved. Maybe the caregiver is the same person who is taking care of both the donor and the recipient. So it doesn't you, this is not a system that you can expand if you're going to have donors travel to the transplant center. So then the next option is the, the, make the kidney travel, right? You take the kidney out where the donor lives, and then you put the kidney on a plane and ship it to where the recipient is for that particular kidney. So then that brings the question, do kidneys like these airplane rides any better than we do? Like, what about the kidney? Does it really enjoy these rides? So as I briefly mentioned before, we have to think about ischemic time. Ischemic time is the time that the kidney spends outside the body when it is not getting blood. And this includes the time that it is sitting in a cold solution, you know, and being shipped on aeroplanes before it can get into the person who needs it. So cold time is known to be detrimental to the kidney function and survival in diseased donor kidneys. So when you look at patients who get a kidney transplant from a deceased donor, we have known for a long time that if the kidney comes from far away and it spent 18 hours uh, sitting in solution before it could be transplanted or 24 hours or more than 24 hours, then the kidney often doesn't function as well. It is slow to function. Uh, it takes time to recover from the fact that it was without blood for such a long time. And then, you know, these kidneys may not survive as long as compared to kidneys with shorter cold times. So what about live donor transplants? Remember, the reason we want to do live donor transplants, one of the reasons is that you get better organ quality. And part of this better organ quality means that the kidney is doesn't have ischemia time, right? So does requiring what is the impact of the shipping these live donor kidneys and across the country with added cold ischemia time. So this was one of the concerns that came up when you first started doing the kidney pair donation program. So this was uh, looking, so first they did what they call a simulation. So they looked, uh, or uh, not a simulation, actually, first they didn't look at kidney pair donation itself, but they looked at donors and kidney uh, transplants from donors just regular live kidney donor transplants, but they looked at people who cold ischemia time varied. Like in some cases, the cold ischemia time was only zero to two hours, others it was two to four hours, four to six hours, and six to eight hours. So these were not necessarily part of the kidney paired exchange program. These were all prior to the implementation of these kidney paired exchange programs. But for one reason or the other, there was extended cold ischemia time, maybe because you know they were done at geographic centers which were close to each other or something. But what they found was that there was a small increase in delayed graft function. Delayed graft function is when the kidney doesn't work right away between the zero to two hours and the four to six hour groups. But there was no difference in one year graft function. So when you looked at long term graft function, it was perfectly fine. There was no change in graft survival. So it didn't really matter. It, it seemed that for these live donor kidneys, it didn't really seem to matter if you looked at uh, even going up to eight hours of cold ischemia time, it didn't really seem to make a big difference to the final survival of these kidneys. Then as the National Kidney Registry, you know, started doing more and more transplants and we got more data, there was another study which was published in 2011, which looked at transplants that happened through the National Kidney Registry in the three years between 2007 to 2010. This involved 56 shipped live donor kidneys, the median cold ischemia time was about seven hours. And again, there were no cases of delayed graft function. So overall, the feeling was that this is pretty safe. 
And then a more recent paper, which was published in 2018, actually had more data to work with. So now they looked at the entire NKR experience from 2008 to 2015. So over the, you know, about seven year period, they had 1,200 shipped kidney transplants versus 205 non-shipped kidney paired donor transplants. And they compared them to 4,800 just regular live donor kidney transplants. And what they found was that shipped kidneys these 1,200 shipped kidneys had a median cold ischemia time of about nine hours versus about one hour or a little less than one hour for kidneys which were not shipped or kidneys, you know, just happening as regular live donor transplants. And they found that there was a 5% increased odds of delayed graft function for each hour of cold ischemia time. So that means that for delayed graft function, again, is what we call a sleepy kidney, where the kidney doesn't quite perk up and work right away. The odds of that increased a tiny bit. So about 5% for each extra hour, more than you know one hour that the kidney spent outside the body. But again, there was no difference in patient or graft survival. So in the long term, these kidneys do just fine. And they're just as good as other live donor kidneys that come from somebody or you know that come from a donor who is right next to you in the next operating room as compared to an operating room eight hours across the country. If you remember when I talked about, you know, having the number of pairs be, uh, you know, high, if you, the more people you have in this marketplace, the more likely you are to find a match, right? So one question was, if we just keep putting incompatible pairs, can we actually, you know, how, how, how do we even increase the size of this market? Can we put in compatible pairs? What happens if we put in compatible pairs? Compatible pairs are people who don't have trouble with their donor. Like they don't have any HLA antibodies against the donor. They don't have any blood group antibodies against the donor. Technically, they could get a kidney from this donor. But what happens if we enter those compatible pairs into the kidney pair donation program? Can we actually help more people if we include compatible people? And the answer is yes. So this was a mathematical simulation which was published by Summer Gentry in 2007. And what it said was, and here you can see, if you include compatible pairs, that's basically anybody who really wants to help other people. Like you say to people, hey, you know, you could get a kidney from your donor, but if you enroll yourself in this exchange, it may take another maybe two months or three months, you know, for you, you may have to wait two to three months before you get your transplant rather than getting a transplant right away, but you could help another incompatible pair. So those are what we call altruistic compatible pairs. Then those are the black bars here. And then you have compatible pairs who might benefit, right? You say, hey, listen, if you are compatible with each other, but you could actually get a younger donor or you could get a donor who is closer to your size. So if we include those donors only, not the altruistic donors, and then you have these light gray bars, which are those without compatible, with, without, without any compatible participation. So the gray bars, the light gray bars basically show you what would the marketplace look like if we only put incompatible pairs. The white bars show you what happens to the number of matches in the marketplace if we include compatible pairs who might benefit. And then the black bars or the dark gray bars here basically show you what happens if you include pairs who may not themselves benefit all that much, but they, you know, you just sort of introduce them into the exchange. So you can see the more compatible pairs that we put into the exchange. So the percentage of compatible pairs who are willing to participate in the paired exchange program is on the X axis. You can see here that the more compatible pairs who are willing to participate, the more likelihood you are the more likelihood you have of finding a match for your incompatible pairs. So what they suggested was that if you include compatible pairs, you can increase the match rate from 28% to 64% for a single center program. So that's the problem with having a small program, right? His, if you include only incompatible pairs, but you're only doing it at your center, you may not have enough pairs there to find matches for your people. But if you start including compatible pairs from your center, you can improve your match rate to 64%. Now, when you do it for a national program, again, you can see that there is a benefit to including compatible pairs. So match rates for even small programs could be improved by including compatible pairs. So 
that's a good thing for incompatible pairs. You know, we as a program, if we make efforts to include people who are compatible with each other into the program, but it's kind of a hard sell, right? People who want, who've been waiting on dialysis for many years or who have kidney failure and are about to start dialysis and about to get a kidney, these are not the people who want to wait. They don't want to be like, they want to help other people, but they also want to help themselves, right? So do compatible pairs benefit from kidney pair donation? Is there a scenario where we can introduce compatible pairs and basically promise them some benefit? So the primary attraction for compatible pairs to enter is if you can get a younger and or a better HLA matched donor. So I haven't talked a lot about matching from a tissue perspective, but we talked about incompatibility, right? So incompatibility means that you really cannot get that person's kidney because you have antibodies against them. But you can get it, you know, you can get a kidney from somebody who doesn't look like you, who has completely different HLA antigens from you, as long as you don't have a pre-existing reaction to them. So you don't have antibodies against them, you could get a kidney from anybody who, and they may look completely different from you. But if you actually get a kidney from somebody who looks somewhat like you, like let's say a brother or a sister or you know another si a sibling, or somebody who looks almost exactly like you, like sometimes a, you know a twin obviously would be like that, an identical twin, or even sometimes brothers and sisters because of the way that genes can rearrange themselves might end up looking almost like a twin to you genetically. Okay, so if you get better HLA matching, that can make your kidney last longer because your immune system is less likely to react to those kidneys and therefore you get less rejection and more graft survival in those kidneys. So it would be good to get an HLA match donor if you can, particularly if you're a young person and you're trying to get a kidney that's going to last you for many, many years. So the simulation that was done by Sommer Gentry suggested that if compatible pairs uh, participated in this registry, that they could have a 34% chance of matching to a donor greater than 10 years younger or avoiding a child to mother or a spousal combination. These are combinations which can you know, be more prone to rejection. Plus there's a 17% chance of matching to somebody similar. So in the simulation that they did, what they said was if you introduce compatible pairs into it, they may have a total of about 50% chance, 51% chance where either they would benefit greatly or they may be, it may be a neutral trade for them where they don't really benefit all that much, but they also don't lose much. So what she suggested was that the majority of compatible pairs could benefit based on her simulation. Now, the Mayo Clinic published recently their kidney pair donor exchange uh, experience from 2007 to 2018 with a focus on compatible pairs. So they looked at 54 compatible pairs who received a transplant during this time over these 11 years. And the reasons for enrolling these compatible pairs into their exchange program, the biggest reason, the majority was an age or size mismatch. Then you had people who had mismatches in terms of CMV and EBV. So CMV and EBV are viruses. These can cause infections and EBV can cause a problem called lymphoma after kidney transplant. And people who are mismatched, so if the donor has never been exposed to EBV or CMV and gets a kidney, sorry, if the recipient has never been exposed to EBV or CMV and gets a kidney from a donor who has been exposed to EBV or CMV in the past, then they have a higher risk of developing these infections. So ideally, we want to avoid these sort of mismatches. So those were the kind of, you know, the other patients who had been enrolled in this uh, compatible pairs who had been enrolled in their kidney paired exchange program. So those were the CMV and EBV mismatch. And then about 20% of this group included people who were altruistic, you know, pairs, pairs that decided to participate in it just so they could help other people. So what they found was that the compatible pairs who entered into this kidney paired exchange program, they all benefited from this transaction. So the people who had enrolled in it because of age and size mismatch, they all received a younger kidney. And on a, you know, on an average, the kidney that they got was 18 years younger and 36 points better in terms of the KDPI, which is a way of measuring kidney quality. And those who were CMV mismatched or EBV mismatched, 
nine out of 10 found a CMV negative donor and all of the EBV mismatches were able to find an EBV negative donor. And even the people who donated altruistically, the people who said, hey, we are not necessarily looking for a younger kidney or a better matched kidney, et cetera, but we just want to help other people, they also ended up getting a better kidney with a median KDPI score of 26 points lower. So incompatible pairs who enter the kidney paired exchange program, oh, sorry, compatible pairs who exchange the kidney paired exchange program do benefit based on these simulations and these small experiences that we have seen from these centers. So this is a way of increasing the incompatible donor transplants, but sort of, you know, a out of the box way of increasing your incompatible donor transplants. And this is another graph which basically shows all the kidneys that are transplanted in the National Kidney Registry, what have their outcomes been compared to just regular living donor kidney transplants. So this was a uh, sort of you know, analysis of uh, 2,300 patients who had been transplanted through the National Kidney Registry. Now remember, in the kidney paired registry, people are often in the registry because they are ABO or HLA incompatible. And the people who are HLA incompatible often tend to be women because they have been exposed to uh, HLA antigens as a result of pregnancy. We know that people who are hyperimmunized or people who have repeat transplants are more likely to be in this. And then people who are black and, pub and those who are on public insurance were also more likely to be in this kidney paired exchange program. So these are people who are high risk of developing rejection, people who are at higher risk of having graft loss as compared to the average sort of live donor recipient. So what they found was that when you looked at graft function, that is the functioning of the kidney, five-year graft function and seven-year, this is the rate of graft failure actually. So five-year graft failure and seven-year graft failure were both lower in the National Kidney Registry patients as compared to live donor kidney transplants, as well as unrelated live donor transplants. So you can see that five year, the graft survival appears to be superior. And you can also see that the patient mortality is lower in this group of patients as compared to patients who are just, you know, controlled live donor kidney transplant recipients. So essentially what you find is that there is no detriment to participating in the NKR. And ultimately the better quality kidneys that you get from a live donor with the possibility for better matching really results in better graft function and better patient survival in this cohort. So kidney pair donation, as you saw, evolved as in, you know, evolved from an effort to help incompatible pairs. But can it also be harnessed to maximize the potential of non-directed donors? So who are non-directed donors? So these are donors who used to be called altruistic donors in the past. And now we prefer the term non-directed because, you know, uh, even people who are related to the uh, recipient are ultimately, you know, doing an altruistic act. So we don't want to certainly imply that those who are biologically or emotionally related to the recipient are not altruistic. So non-directed donors are those who are not related to the recipient and don't even know who the intended recipient is or any characteristics of this intended recipient. And they actually, this is a growing number. And you can see here a figure on the left side which looks at data from 1997 through 2017 and counts the number of transplants that occurred from non-directed donors. And you can see that that number has been increasing over these years. And 5.6% of live kidney donors in the US in 2019 were non-directed donors. In general, when you look at these donors, they tend to be young. The median age was 45 years. The A little over half of them tend to be women. 92% of this cohort that they looked at was white, and they tend to be a little bit more educated than the average population. So 51% had either associate degrees or higher education. So those are the characteristics of these non-directed donors. So coming back to this lecture, remember the thickness of the market, the congestion? So one question is, can we reduce congestion in this market? And can we at the same time maximize the potential of this non-directed donor? So how many transplants can a non-directed donor facilitate? So typically you would think of a non-directed donor, you know, a person came in and said, hey, I want to donate my kidney. I read about it or I watched this webinar by Dr. Chandran and I felt like, you know, 
I need to really go donate my kidney and help some one of these 90,000 people who's waiting on the wait list. The traditional way to do it was to say, okay, well, we'll check you out, make sure you're in good health, that you are mentally sound. And then we will take your kidney and give it to a patient on the waiting list, the person who is maybe at the top of the list or the patient who has been very difficult to match. So this one kidney would help one person. But is there a way that we can use this one kidney to actually increase the number of transplants? How about if we put this kidney not into one person waiting on the list, but actually into one of the people who are waiting for a paired exchange donor? Can we initiate a chain? So this is what was Dr. Roth's, uh, Professor Roth's thinking that a chain initiated by a non-directed donor can be arranged so that each patient donor pair gets a kidney before they give one. And the cost of a broken link here isn't nearly as great because let's say that even if the donor decides not to donate because of the presence of this altruistic donor in the system, you have not, you know, the other recipient has not lost their bargaining chip. And I can show you that in the next figure that on the next slide and makes it easier to understand. And basically this avoids the congestion because these chains can now be done non-simultaneously. Because if the risk of a broken link is not so high, the cost of a broken link is not so high, then you don't have to do these tra uh, transplants simultaneously. You don't have to have like eight different transplant surgeons and four different operating rooms for you to do all these transplants. So the marketplace will now allow more exchanges and more transplants to be done because you don't have to assemble all of these operating rooms at the same time. So this is an example of what we call a domino paired exchange or a non, uh, you know, a never ending, in some ways, a never ending, uh, this can be extended into a never ending altruistic donor chain. But this altruistic donor who is at the right hand of this panel of this figure that you see here, donates to recipient one who is incompatible with their donor. Once this person donates, then donor one then goes on and donates to recipient two. Donor two, who is not compatible with either recipient one or recipient two, then donates to recipient three, and then so on. So recipient three donor still hasn't donated. So even if this donor now backs out or one of these donors backs out, nobody is harmed essentially because this, this the next, let's say donor two backs out. So recipient three is still unharmed because recipient three donor is yet to donate, okay? So that is why the introduction of this altruistic donor actually changes the risk equation a little bit. So, and then this can of course have a domino effect on downstream transplants because as you can see, donor two is not compatible with recipient one or two, but the entry of this altruistic donor was actually able to facilitate the donation downstream into recipient three. So this amplifies the impact of non-directed donation. So there was an analysis of UNO's data from 2008 to 2011 by Mark Belcher, which looked at 77 non-directed donors. And these 77 non-directed donors were actually able to initiate chains resulting in 373 chain transplants. So rather than these 77 non-directed donors resulting in 77 transplants, we were able to transplant 276 more people as a result of these donors. So this is exactly, you know, this leads us to the next one, which is called a non-simultaneous extended altruistic donor chain, where as you see here, you know, you have this altruistic donor donating to recipient one. So donor one gives to recipient two, donor two gives to recipient three, and then you have this donor three hanging around. So you might even finish this chain over here and donor three can hang around and act as a bridge donor or what, you know, essentially an altruistic donor for starting the next chain, which doesn't have to be done simultaneously. This can be done sometime later, like a few months later or a few weeks later or even a year later. So this bridge donor, obviously you don't want to wait too long in case the bridge donor ends up falling sick or not being eligible, but this bridge donor can end up starting a new chain. So here again, we say the same principle, the non-directed donor starting this chain one, the cluster one, and then you have this bridge donor, donor three, who is starting cluster two. And at the end of it, if you cannot find a, another chain that can be started by donor six, 
then donor six can complete this chain finally by donating to the wait list. So this also improves transplant logistics because obviously you don't have to do everything simultaneously and there is no need for reciprocal matching, right? Because the problem with paired exchange is that you need to complete the pair. You need to have X donating to Y and A donating to B, but you need to find a Y and a B because it has to be reciprocal because people have to get their kidneys. But here, because things are non-simultaneous and these chains can go on for a bit and because of entering this non-directed donor into the system, you don't have an obligation for reciprocal match. And now it also allows you the luxury of picking a, you know, recipients in the chain and matching them with donors that can lead to the longest or the highest quality chain so that your software can be programmed so you find the best age matching or the best HLA matches. So you don't, you know, so some of these outcomes can potentially be improved by using this non-simultaneous extended donor chain. Well, what happens if a chain is broken, right? Because the whole you know, idea of doing it simultaneously was that nobody reneges, reneges on their sort of you know, commitment to this. And if you allow people time, like a few weeks or a few months, then can the bridge donor change their mind? So this group by Cohen uh, you know, looked at analysis, uh, NKR transplants that happened between 2008 and 2016. And they found that over that period of time, there were 344 chains and 74 loops that were completed, which resulted in 1,700 transplants. There were 20 broken chains, so 5.8% overall, and one broken loop that was identified. And the most common cause you know, of this was a donor medical issue, which occurred while the patient was acting as a bridge donor. So you know, people who, like for instance, there was a person who was diagnosed with prostate cancer in the meantime, or other medical issues, which made it a bad idea for them to donate. So that, was the most common cause. And then there were other causes where the donors changed their mind that happened in about six cases. And the kidney was declined by the recipient surgeon that happened in about four cases. So what they found was that most of the donors, you know, who ended up, the bridge donors who ended up not working out was because of medical issues or because of organ decline by the recipient surgeon and not really when, you know, of them changing their mind. So that only accounted for about 1.5% of broken chains. And the mean length of these chains, broken and complete, was about the same. And then all recipients involved in a broken chain subsequently received a transplant. So that it seemed like overall, this is not a system that is prone to abuse and that this can actually be a realistic, uh, realistically applicable sort of system to imp improve the rate of transplants while incurring only a small amount of risk. So this is another novel idea. So for instance, now, you know, you have non-directed donors to start who can start these chains, right? But still, the number of non-directed donors is not very many. I mean, they've been increasing over time. But is there another source of organs that we can use to start these chains and achieve more transplants? So deceased donor kidneys are typically allocated to a person on the wait list, and then that person gets their transplant, right? And then that's it. But what if you divert this deceased donor kidney from the patients on the wait list, you know, of where they would have normally gone and use it to start a chain? If you use it to start a chain, can you actually end up doing more transplants that way? So this was a simulation. This was not actually real, but, you know, because you're not allowed to do that right now. But what they found was they looked at data from 2016 to 2017, deceased donor transplant data. And they used data from one of these kidney pad donation programs, the Alliance for KPD, to simulate the pool and uh, the disease donor initiated chains. And they compared these simulations to short chains initiated by the disease donor. And what they found was that if you take less than 3% of deceased donor kidneys and allocate them to these chains, that you can increase the uh, number of kidney transplants by up to 290. So that's 290 people who are going to be removed from the waiting list for a deceased donor, right? So ultimately, this could help you to improve the access even for people who are waiting for a deceased donor kidney because you remove, again, congestion on the waiting list. 
And what they found in this simulation was that blood type O transplants increased. So it didn't really harm the people who were on the waiting list in some ways. And that increased living donors were available to waitlist candidates. So taking those people off the waitlist can help. So this is not something that has been done yet or implemented yet, but it is an important area for our allocation experts to think about whether how to maximize these organs that are in short supply. Finally, I want to talk about advanced donation programs. So, you know, as we evolved from kidney pet donation programs happening simultaneously to these non uh, sort of, you know, non simultaneous extended altruistic donor chains. The next question was, do we even need a chain? Do we even need to, you know, start a chain or do other things for people to donate? What if we can instead promise an even more delayed transplant to them in return for them donating? What if there is no limitation? on getting a kidney transplant in return for donating a kidney. So this is this started off because there was a grandfather who wanted to donate to their grandchild. But at the time that they wanted to donate, the grandchild's kidney function was still OK, and they were not expected to receive a kidney, you know, to need a kidney transplant for a while. So the question was, can we donate a kidney and then have our grandchild get a kidney transplant later when they need it? So an advanced donor, ADP donor is somebody who desires to donate by a specific date. Let's say they have to be in the military after that, or, uh, you know, uh, like I said, you know, somebody who is a grandparent and who may age out of being a donor candidate, but their paired recipient has not yet been matched to a specific donor scheduled for surgery. And what this person does is that this donor person, this donor one signs the ADP consent, their recipient is either not ready yet or they don't have even an identified recipient at this point, but they go ahead and donate to recipient two. Donor two may also be an advanced donor, and this chain could theoretically continue. You don't even need to necessarily have a chain in this, but you basically have these donors who, they started off by introducing this donor one as a non-directed donor and starting a chain. But then it moved on to becoming turning into a voucher system. So this emerged, like I said, as a response to chronological incompatibility. So the first case was in 2014, where the 64-year-old grandfather donated a kidney to a non-related individual, and his four-year-old grandson was provided with an NKR voucher for a future kidney transplant. And the child was expected to need a transplant in 10 to 15 years, at which point the grandfather might no longer be eligible to donate. So these voucher donors, you know, this donor one, and then put could started a chain, donor two started a chain, and donor three started a chain. You found that the first three voucher donors resulted in 25 mm -hmm. transplants through the kidney pair donations across the US. So now you have what we call the advanced donation program, and several of these terminologies are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the standard voucher, which I've highlighted here in black, which is, you know, number four from the top, is where the donor donates before their intended recipient is scheduled for transplant surgery. So this is somebody, like you say, you know, you're going to study abroad for two years. Your uh, father may need a transplant, maybe in two years or three years or so. So you donate now so that it doesn't get in the way of your plans. You can continue your life and do your stuff. And then when your dad is ready to get his transplant, then he can get a kidney transplant through the NKR. The other situation is a family voucher. A family voucher is where you don't even have anybody necessarily who needs a kidney transplant right now or in the immediate future, but you are thinking that they may need one in the distant future, or you're just planning for the possibility, given this rising prevalence of CKD and end-stage renal disease, that one of your loved ones is going to need a transplant in the future. So this donor donates before knowing whether their intended recipients will ever need a transplant. Maybe they have a genetic condition which predisposes some people to it, but not other people. Maybe they have, they heard about it on the radio and they're concerned that, you know, somebody in their family might need a kidney in the future. So they want to get what we call a family voucher. So this can apply up to, I think, five family members that any of, so you donate your kidney and then anybody in your family, five designated people, if they need a kidney at some point in the future, they will be able to redeem this voucher through the National Kidney Registry. 
So there has been a you know really explosive growth if you take a look at it in voucher based donations. So these are this blue line here basically shows all voucher donations since the first time it was introduced in 2014 and you can see that there has been a pretty steep rise in the number of these donors. What about if there is a huge growth in the voucher system? I mean, it sounds all nice and fancy now, like, you know, to give vouchers to all these people, but what happens when you have to pay the bill, when you have to redeem, redeem these vouchers? And are there different patterns of growth that can impact the risk of non-redemption? So this was a study published recently by Matt Cooper, who did a 50-year simulation study of the advanced donation program. And what they did was they looked at five different scenarios. So what they said was, we can plan for rapid growth where voucher donors increase by 5% compounded year after year or slow growth, or you might have rapid growth and then rapid decline, which would be the worst case scenario because a lot of people end up donating their kidney, but then all of a sudden for some one reason or the other people stop donating. And then you have this whole bank of people who may end up showing up 10, 15, 20 years later to redeem their vouchers. And all of a sudden you don't have enough donors in the National Kidney Registry or to you know, provide kidneys to these people. So that was a situation where they said the number of voucher donors in their simulation, they use this as a definition, they go 5% year after year for the first 25 years and then declines rapidly for the next 25 years. Then you could have a slow growth and then a slow decline. And then you could have a rapid growth and then plateau. The voucher donors increase at 5% each, each year for the first 25 years and then remain constant in years 26 to 50. So I'm not going to show the results for all of these models, all of these scenarios that they looked at, but just looking at the rapid growth and the rapid decline, which was called the worst case scenario, what they looked at here on the left side panel is the coverage ratio. So the coverage ratio is the number of available donors per voucher redemption. So you want it to be at least one. So what it, if you have one, it means that you have at least one donor for that person. If it goes below one is where you're in a danger zone, where you don't have enough donors sort of to uh, you know, give a kidney to this voucher redemption. So what they saw was when you look at the 50th percentile, you know, so you can see that it is way over one, but even when you look at the, uh, in a rapid growth and rapid decline sort of scenario, you can see that over 45, 40, 45, 50 years, you might go down, but you barely, you know, you still manage to keep your head over water and that you can still manage to have a rate which is greater than one. So the lowest it went was you know, 1.5, 1.4 when you did a 50 year simulation, suggesting that even with a rapid growth and a rapid decline scenario, you're not going to be, you, know, you are still very unlikely to be at risk for voucher non-redemption. So what they concluded was that the expanded voucher program should satisfy the likely redemption of vouchers under a range of possible scenarios over a 50 year time horizon. However, there are still risks of the voucher program, right? And these risks are all listed in the consent form, uh, which is available at the kidneyregistry.org. And this is you know, one of the consents that the folks have to sign before they can give their kidney. And they, some of these risks may be unforeseeable. What happens if the National Kidney Registry goes bankrupt? So there is a statement in there you know, uh, which says that the advanced donation program obligations include that all NKR member centers and their partner centers agree to work with each other in good faith under the leadership of the NKR surgical director, should the NKR ever become insolvent and or cease operations to provide kidneys for advanced donation program recipients. This obligation is irrevocable, exists in perpetuity and survives the termination of this contract. So certainly the intent is there to redeem all these vouchers. And based on these simulations, it looks like you know, that will be a realistic prospect. But again, you know, we cannot predict the future, none of us. And because of that, you know, these advanced donor programs do involve a good discussion of risks with the don intended with the potential donor, and then they have to sign this consent to participate in it. So to summarize what oh, actually, before we summarize, I have to talk about the impact of the National Kidney Registry. So in a few slides, I will just show what has been accomplished so far. So National Kidney Registry, as I noted before, is the largest kidney pair donation uh, organization in the US and it has facilitated 6, 000, over 6,500 transplants since the time it started, so 2008 to present. And as you can see, you know, the growth has been very good. UCSF is one of the top centers in the National Kidney Registry. 
and here you can see that in the last uh, so you know in the last uh, years july to 2021 to june 2022 uh, 54 transplants at ucsf uh, happened through the nkr and finally, here you can see that participation in the NKR expedites the time to transplant. And as you know, we have, as people have started using more of the NKR registry with the addition of these non-directed donors, voucher donors, and so on, that waiting times have been pretty good. So this is in months. And you can see on an average that uh, patients wait about one and a half months to two months to get their kidney transplant. And this last one just shows you the increase in the family voucher donors and, you know, voucher based donation. So basically these orange circles represent voucher based donations and this blue circles were the standard, you know, altruistic donors. And you can see that voucher donations have outpaced altruistic donation by 2019 and it helped the total number of non directed donors to triple by 2021. So I think the future looks rosy here, uh, at least in some ways, if we, if we can make a small change in the number of our patients getting transplanted. And hopefully, you know, such innovations will help us to uh, accomplish our goals of transplanting all the people on the wait list. So to summarize, live donor kidney transplants are the preferred option for treatment of end-stage renal disease. Kidney paired exchange programs facilitate and increase transplants in recipients with HLA and ABO incompatible donors, as well as improving graft matching in compatible pairs. And innovations such as the inclusion of compatible pairs, non-directed donor initiated chains, and advanced donations have further maximized the pool of live donors for kidney transplant. So I will end here, and uh, I hope that still leaves some time to answer any questions that people might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Chandran, for uh... Um, you know, an incredibly comprehensive review and, you know, I've learned a lot, I'm sure everyone else has who, who have been listening. You know, we've had a, um, a few questions pop up and, you know, in one of your earlier slides, you spoke about um, this notion of donor and recipient matching and you gave examples of um, somebody who is a smaller individual wanting to donate to a larger individual or you gave an example of an older individual wanting to donate to a very young individual now the question popped up regarding an upper age limit for donation um, and i just wanted to ask you a, a little bit about that recipient and donor matching and that you know is there an upper age limit and or are there appropriate recipients for uh, appropriate donors of all sizes and ages Right. So I think that's a good question. Um, the thing is, we don't have an upper age limit per se. I think our goal is to maximize the utilization of donors. And our goal is to get, you know, if people are healthy and they are willing and they pass all these tests and they have adequate kidney function, then it really doesn't matter to us necessarily that they are 60 years old or 70 years old and sometimes you know even up to 80 years old right but the biological reality that we have to deal with is that as people get older they develop more disease in their blood vessels we also lose nephrons nephrons are these units in the kidney the small filters that actually filter stuff and do the work of the kidney and everybody loses nephrons as they get older. So an older person may be in perfectly good health, but have lower kidney function or potential for, you know, they have lost kidney function all through all those years. So ideally we want to match them to a person also of their size or age, right? There are older people waiting on the kidney transplant waiting list. So ideally, if we could do age matching or size matching, this would help to optimize the graft survival and the patients so that the patients get a kidney that lasts as long as the rest of their life. So a person who is 70 and getting a kidney transplant may do very well, for, you know, when they get a kidney from a 70 year old donor. And a person who is 20 getting a kidney from a 70 year old may also do well temporarily, but not in the long term. So we would not turn that 70 year old donor away because I think that 70 year old still has, you know, room for, you know, still allows us to help somebody who needs a transplant. But by using these creative sort of ways by potentially entering them into the kidney paired exchange program or, uh, you know, um, 
other sorts of methods, we could, through advanced donation or other sorts of systems, we could try to get a kidney for every recipient that matches their needs. Yeah, no, wonderful. Um, the the other question that um, has come up are um, uh, surrounding donors and post donation um, uh, sort of lifestyle changes or monitoring that goes into um, uh, kidney donors. Can you speak a little bit about um, any uh, changes that donors have to make to their lifestyle? monitoring that happens afterwards and advice that you give uh, um, sort of kidney donors to uh, either avoid or not avoid in terms of food uh, specifically sort of um, you know the the one example that was given was uh, Chinese herbal use such as ginseng but you know just a broader category of uh, do's and don'ts post donation right so I think the thing is that um, kidney donors are healthy people, right? By definition, they don't have any disease. When we take away one kidney from them, they still rem remain healthy people. So in some sense, we don't have any major restrictions and we only take kidneys away from people who can afford to lose one, who have enough kidney function so that even after we take their one kidney away from them, they still have enough kidney function to cope with pretty much all that life can throw at them right, including herbs, for instance. So I think that in general, our recommendations for people who donate are that they don't have to make big changes in their diet or their habits as a result of donating the kidney, but they should still follow practices which are recommended for healthy US population. So according to the Center for Disease Control and the US Preventive Services Task Force, people should not be eating excessively salty foods. People should be exercising regularly and they should uh, be at a healthy weight. In addition, so those are the recommendations we give to our donors. We don't have them restrict any foods or anything of that sort. And we do tell them, however, to be vigilant for risk factors that can cause kidney failure. So if they develop high blood pressure or develop diabetes, we want them to take care of those conditions so that they don't end up needing a kidney themselves. And when it comes to things like herbs, I think not all herbs are the same. So, you know, so there are herbs which can cause kidney damage. So there is an herb called Aristolochia, which for instance, uh, is, uh, has been implicated in some cases of people getting kidney cancers and kidney failure as a result of uh, these herbs being toxic. On the other hand, ginseng, as far as we know, doesn't have any associations with kidney failure. But I think it's important for donors to be vigilant uh, about their eating and drinking and so on to, you know, to sort of avoid um, unusual things, you know, things that we would tell healthy people to avoid. They don't need to avoid anything specifically because they're a kidney donor. And one option that all our donors have at UCSF is that they can contact us anytime. If they have any questions about a particular food or a supplement or an herb that they want to take, then we can certainly look into it and give them more specific advice about it. Thank you very much. You know, and then, you know, one last question before, um, and I really appreciate your, all of your time and expertise, but a question that popped up on rounds today was um, a daughter whose mother donated to her was looking at her mother's labs and saw that her mother's kidney function had, um, or creatinine had increased post donation. And the question was, um, you know, is that increase on uh, the, the day after um, donation going to be the level that she expects her mother to be at or would you, would you expect that to change over time? So your question is like you know when you donate one kidney your kidney function goes down your total kidney function right you start off with 100% kidney function now you've donated a kidney and now you're at 50% the next day when we check your blood test so that's normal you know you once you give your kidney away then you can't have your cake and eat it too, essentially. So, <laughs> so, I, so that part is normal to have reduced kidney function after you give away one kidney. Now you can't make more filters. You're born with a certain amount of filters and that's it. Those are the nephrons. So your remaining kidney cannot, doesn't have the ability to double in size or you know make like generate twice as many 
filters, but what it can do is each little filter can do more work. And what we call that is compensatory hyperfiltration. What it just means is that each little filter is compensating for the loss of the other kidney by doing more filtering. However, there is a limit to this compensation so that instead of being at 50%, you may end up being at 60 or 70% of your original kidney function, but it's still going to be lower. And the degree of compensation also depends on your age and your health. So young people may compensate more, older people may compensate less, but everybody may compensate a little bit, but the donor's kidney function may not be perfect. It's not going to be perfect because they only have one kidney as opposed to having two kidneys. It's still going to be good enough, but it's going to show up on blood tests as being lower and the reason it shows up as being lower is because the lab uses the value for people with two kidneys. So the lab says, hey, for a healthy person with two kidneys, this is how much function you should have. So anything that comes below that is flagged by the lab as being abnormal, but that doesn't mean that they're a person with kidney disease. That kidney is still a good, healthy kidney, and the decline in their kidney function, the trajectory of change in their kidney function is going to be like a person with two kidneys. So we expect that kidney function to stay good for many, many years, unlike you know, fall, fall, fall for patients that we see who have kidney failure. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think the day after surgery, the kidney function is going to be at 50% because it just donated a kidney, but then maybe in a few weeks or months, you will see it settle down and that number is going to be their new baseline. Yeah, no, I, I, that's exactly what I was, um, getting as understanding folks understanding the compensatory mechanisms that are in, in place to uh, to take up the slack. Right. Um, you know, we could talk all night about different um, different permutations and uh, interesting things that you have shared in terms of all of these different innovations. But um, you know, the it's been really sort of eye-opening and I hope um, enjoyable for everyone who's watching and um, and uh, you know if there are any questions that um, you know for follow-up questions both myself and Dr. Chandran are always available to to answer any of those. Thank you so, for giving me this opportunity Dr. Syed. Yeah no of course and uh, thanks very much for taking the time and thanks everyone else for for, for joining.